Moses on the heart of a leader. But before we get into today's message, I just want to recap just a little bit from what we've had for this, uh, leading up to this point in this series. And so, so if we're going to be a leader, whether it's a leader in our in our church, it's a leader in our in our community, it's a leader in our in our job, it's a leader in our family, in our household, leading leading in our marriage, uh, wherever it's at that we're going to, if we're going to be a leader and we want to be a godly leader, then then we we learned that that uh, we need to be we need to be um, real, right? We we learned that we need to make sure that. Uh, even with the, the stuff in our background, we need to still be authentic and real and be honest about who we are, where we've been, because God brings us through some stuff, doesn't he? And it strengthens us where he's taken us, right? And so we need to be real, right, and authentic. And then we also learned the week after that, we, we learned that, that we need to be driven, right? We need to be driven. We need to, we need, God puts a passion in each and every one of us that, that gives us this, this passion, this desire to do, and, and we're going we're gonna to live out the passion that he puts within us one way or the other. It's a matter of are we going to live it out in an undisciplined, with undisciplined actions in an undisciplined sort of way, or are we going to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and drive us forward with that passion? And are we going to do it God's way or not? And then we, uh, uh, we learned that we need to be surrendered. We have to surrender. We have to be surrendered. See, we, we all have things we want. I, I, you know, I want to do it my way, right? Um, I, I, I have my dreams. I have my desires. The thing is, though, that God has this plan, and he has his desire, and we need to be willing to, to, to surrender our dreams, our what I want for what God's calling us to. Okay, so we need to surrender. Then we also need to be committed. We talked about that last week. We need to be committed. We need to be committed to what God's calling us to do. We need to be committed, so committed to God's plan that we're okay if we get trapped. Remember that? We, and, and so committed to God's plan that we're okay if we get trapped and we'll be brave within that trap. We'll be brave within that process of coming out of that trap. Okay, we, we're committed to his plan, and then, then so committed to that plan that we're willing to surrender. So committed that we'll surrender ourselves, we'll surrender anything that we have, we'll surrender us for his will, for his desire, right? We, so we need to be committed to God's plan and do God's plan God's way. Okay, so, and then now today we're going to talk about being smart. We're going to talk about being smart in God's plans, and so... Not smart Alec, right? No, I can be that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about smart. We're talking about wise, right? We want to be wise in, in, in stepping forward into what God's calling us to do. And so um, I could summarize this entire message into one sentence. We're not meant to do this alone. We're not meant to do it alone. We're not meant to live our life the way God desires us to, we're not meant to do it alone. We're going to start in Exodus 18 here in just a minute. Um, but I want us to understand that God's going to bring people around us. He's going to bring us into the midst of people. There's people who come here and they're like, man, I, I, I didn't, I was trying to live it right and whatever, but it wasn't until I came here and now I suddenly, I got all these people around me, right? And, and that's the same with me when, when my bride and I, we started to celebrate Sioux Falls. Um, man, I, I, well, put aside my struggles with what I, what I, for, uh, Christianity was, uh, in my viewpoint at that point, right? And, and what, why I get so sick of Christianity, the term, uh, today because of how soiled it is. But, but just the fact that coming in amongst a family of believers who actually wrapped their arms around us, walked with us through so many things, right? Um, we're not meant to do it alone. Uh, none of us are. And so this is what, ha what, what um, uh, is going to happen with Moses, right? So Moses, uh, again, uh, we're going to start in 18. Um, but so far up to, where, to verse 13 where we're going to start at, um, um, up to this point, so, so Moses has been, he's been a sla he, he was born uh, into slavery, into condemnation, right? He, he was uh, um, um, Declared to be killed, right? Uh, the the Pharaoh had promised to kill him, but but Moses has come through all that. He's come through that. He's at this point. He's already led the people of e, uh, of Israel out of Egypt, 
Okay, they've already come through the Red Sea, which we talked a little bit about last week. And, and have you noticed I'm leaving plenty for you to go and study yourself? Have you noticed that? Right? Because we could do like a year on Moses' life. And I'm not even kidding. Right? If we wanted to tear it. But I want you to go and do that. Right? So, so they've come through the Red Sea. And if you went and studied anything this last week about it and, and continued that study, then you know that Pharaoh and all of his troops were wiped out. God blotted them out. He said he w- they would never see him again, and they, d- they will never see him again, right? And so they've come through that, and Mo- Moses is leading the Israelites through the wilderness. Now, this group of Israelites, think of this. This is a nation, okay? It's the, the Hebrew nation. This group of Israelites is between 1 and 2 million people, okay? I want to give you some perspective here, okay? Perspective. Uh, number one, San Jose, San Jose, California, population 1 million, just over a million people, San, Ho- San Jose, California. Dallas, Texas, 1.4 million. San Diego, population 1.4 million, just about 1.5. San Antonio, Texas, almost 1.6 million. Philadelphia, PA, almost 1.6 million. Phoenix, Arizona, population 1 and 3 quarter million. The Hebrew nation was between one and two million. It's, we got, we got Arizona, uh, Phoenix, Arizona's walking over the hill, right? Think about that. Dallas is going to walk over San Antonio. You're going to see the entirety of the city, the population of that city. If you're out in the wilderness, I'm, I'm out in the wilderness. I'm just checking out the berries and the sand burrs, right? And I'll look up, and here comes this, this Hebrew nation walks Moses out in front with his staff, right, and it walks over and... and they just don't quit coming. They just, dude, I might have to move back. I, I'm a mile away, right? I mean, they just keep coming and they just keep coming. Think about that. The entirety of that population coming over that man, a living, right? So th- this is a nomadic nation, right? This is a nation with no home. And some of you are thinking, well, no, they got the promised land. But no, they don't. See, so far at this point, they've been promised a land, Yet, they, they have yet to gain that land, though. So Moses is leading them through the wilderness. He's leading them to water. He's leading them to food. He's leading them to shelter. All of that only because God is leading Moses to those things. Okay? And so he's leading them all, all to this point, or uh, to those things, those needs that they have. So, so is, everyone, is everyone with me yet on this? Do we have a better picture of how big the Hebrew nation is? You know, Sioux Falls is pretty tiny, ain't it? Cannes even tinier. Sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our mind around that, isn't it? One to two million people. So um, in, in, in Exodus 18, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes to visit, and he's hanging out, and he's seeing how things are run. And in verse 13, it says, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this uh, you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Be- Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Can you imagine this? Moses is pulling up a, he's pulling up a stool, dude. Right? He's, just, he's just like, check this out. Oh, I put my water on that one. <laughs> Get the open sign out, right? Open for business. You remember, remember the, the uh, Snoopy, right? Uh, what was her name? Lucy, right? That was there with a little psychiatrist thing. Open, right? Moses sits down in the midst of one to two million people. We're going to round it off to one and a half, okay? He's got one and a half million people out there. Anyone with a dis- dispute or disagreement of any sorts to come to him. Can you imagine being the person... <laughs> You're walking up, and you're like, we're going to talk today, right? You go up, you get your little number, and you look at the ticker, and it says, now serving, number eight, 6,324. Oh, crap, this is going to be a long day, right? I mean, come on now. You think there's a couple disagreements in, within that one and a half million people, right? 
this is a long day. And Jethro's sitting there, Moses' father-in-law, not the one off of hillbillies, uh, Jethro's sitting there going, dude, what you doing? And Moses goes, this is what I got to do, right? That's going to make for a long day. And is that going to help the, the tension, right? 6,324, and it's already 10 o'clock. It's only going to make it worse, right? And so uh, Jethro's going to help Moses out here, okay? He's going to help him out. Um, they're waiting for Moses because he's the only one who can give them the answers. He's the only one who can resolve what they need, right? That's, that's why they're coming to him. They believe this is the only place to go, right? That's what they've been instructed. This is where you go. We see Moses now when he's sitting there amongst the one and a half million people, give or take, Sitting amongst them, taking the answers, taking the, taking the, the questions, taking the, uh, 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 the abuse, the disgruntledness, right? Um, he's taking that. Uh, the, Moses is now, you see him as a leader, okay? Um, he's, he's, this is the same Moses that was born a slave and condemned to die the moment he was born, right? This is the same one who was, who was adopted into Pharaoh's, into Pharaoh's palace, yet everyone knew he didn't belong there. It's the same Moses that killed the Egyptian soldier and had to escape. He had to run for his life, exile for 40 years in Midian. Same Moses that was a shepherd for 40 years in Midian. This is the same Moses that did all these things. He's the same Moses that, that went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, right? He's the same Moses that, 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 that had Pharaoh tell him, no, get out of here. Over and over again. It's the same Moses who listened to the gripes and the complaints of the Israelites, who he's supposed to lead. He's listened to over and over again. He's listened to their, their whining, their complaining. Their, he's listened to the This is the same Moses that the Israelites in, in, the, in, the, in the wilderness by the sea said, Oh, there wasn't enough graves in Egypt. You had to bring us out here to die. This is the same Moses. But when Moses is sitting there amongst the one and a half million. When he's sitting there, you know he's the leader. He is no longer that slave. He's no longer that exile. He's no longer that one that they're rejecting all the time. You know, you can see he is now, he is the leader. There's no doubt about it. Why do we know that? Because everyone with a complaint is coming to Moses. Everyone without a complaint, standing around watching. Everyone with a complaint coming to Moses. He is now a leader. He's finally a leader. But we also see in this that he's not a very smart leader. At this point, he's not a very smart leader. Thank you, Jethro, for coming along, right? And so, but here's the thing. If, if we're going to lead, if you and I are going to lead, we need to prayerfully learn our role in God's plan. If we're going to lead in any aspect, we need to prayerfully learn our role in God's plan. Moses, if you think about this, okay, because our role starts out, um, Moses' role initially starts out slave, condemned to die. And then his role changes to adopted son of the Pharaoh's daughter. Then it changes and it changes and it changes, right? And over and over, we need to realize and understand that our role, just because that's what we are in this moment, doesn't mean that's what we're going to be tomorrow. Not when we're following God's plan. Moses' role has changed over and over again, right? And so our plan, we have to understand, we're no better, we're no better than Moses. And we're not going to be any better of a leader than Moses. We're going to have to change also. I've shared with you before, right, that, that man, over and over again, people ask me to step into leadership roles, and I didn't want any of them. I never wanted to be a leader. I was always, I'm like, mm, someone else can do that. Right? But over and over and over again, people saw something in me I did not see, and I believe that's because God put it there. See, when we, so I've changed role to role to role to role to role, all to lead me to where I'm at right now, and guess what? I don't believe this is my final role. I can look back and see each and every time, each and every role that God placed me in, how he's using that, where I'm at today, and he's not done with me. As long as I got breath, as long as I got a pulse, I have opportunity, and that means my role can change. Guess what? 
yours can too. Everything you've done in life is leading up, has led up to the point where you're at right now. I had a conversation with someone the other day, just like uh, I think it was Wednesday. Uh, I had a conversation with someone again that they were talking about, I wish I hadn't. Stop. Stop wishing you hadn't. Now, is it ugly? Maybe it's something you don't want, you're not proud of, right? But stop wishing it hadn't. Stop wishing you could go change it. If you could somehow hop in a time machine, if God would allow that, and you went back and you changed it, you would not be who God desires you to be today. Stop. Don't be proud of the mistakes you've made, the, the flaws you have, right? The ungodliness that's been within you. Don't be, don't be proud of that. But the reality is, it's part of what's brought you to the place where you're at today so that you could step forward into the next step that God has for you in his plan for your life. Moses has a few role changes in his life, and he's going to have more. Our roles have to change in order that we can live out that significant, that, that plan that God has for our life. If we refuse to take the steps, then we refuse to step into the role that he has for us, then we're refusing him and his plan. But if we want to be a leader, a godly leader, anywhere in our life, we have to accept the fact that we have to make, take steps that are going to make us change our role. And we become someone we weren't before. And that's good. That's good. And we need to realize this, right? And so Moses had to realize this. And, and, and so we need to understand that, that uh, each, each and every one of you, in fact, I want you to repeat this with me. I have a significant calling. I, yes, I have a significant calling. I have one, you have one, you have one, you have one, you have one. Each and every one of us has a significant calling. And when we embrace that and we understand that, see, some people are sitting here saying, well, but I'm bottom of the totem pole, I don't really count for much of nothing. Moses was born into slavery and condemned to die. Think he wasn't at the bottom of the totem pole? Right? God's got a plan for us. Our role is significant. We have a significant calling. God's calling for Moses did not allow him to die to the river, to the Egyptian gods. Didn't allow him to die to that. He did not allow him to die to Pharaoh. He didn't allow him to die to the wilderness. He hasn't allowed him to die, right? Um, and it, it, the same is the true for you and for me. When we have that significant calling, God's going to change. He's going to give us steps to take. Um, he's going to change our role, right? And he's going to lead us down the path. But we have to be willing to take those steps. Um, if you think you don't have a significant role, you think you're bottom of the totem pole, um, I shop Menards uh, when, when I have to. <laughs> I'm really not into building projects anymore. But, but when I have to, I have a plumbing problem. Guess what? I'm going to Menards, and I'm, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to talk to you. Who's the most significant person you think there is at Menards? Some are probably thinking CEO, right? Or at least the store manager, right? Not to me. See, oh, I have a problem. I have a pro plumber problem. I have no idea who the CEO is. I don't know if the CEO is a he or a she. I could care less. Because I'm going to aisle seven and talking to, to Bob, right? And, and, and I'm going to go talk to Bob. And I'm going to say, Bob, are you, are, I just want to clarify, do you know plumbing stuff? Or are you like a stock person and you don't know plumbing stuff? I'm okay if you don't know, okay? Because I want you to direct me to the person who does know then, right? But Bob tells me, no, 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 I'm, I'm your guy. And I lay out my problem to Bob. And Bob says, Bob says, no, no, that's not here in aisle seven. That's over here in aisle four. Let me show you. And Bob takes me over and he tells me even what I need to do with the plumbing issue I have, right? Bob is the most important person to me at Menards. Right? I could care less about CEO. He's nobody to me. Right? And so, so here's the thing, right? Do you understand that you may well be the absolute, absolutely only Jesus that someone sees? Do we understand that? Do we really grasp that? See, see Bob... He treats me, if Bob's not the plumbing guy, and he sends me to Phil, 
great, then Phil's my man, right? Bob's, Bob's pretty cool, but Phil's my man, right? So, but, but if Bob is my plumbing guy, and if Bob makes a good impression on me, he shows me he's knowledgeable about what he's talking about. Now, if Bob starts talking to me about two-by-fours, and I'm asking about plumbing, I'm going to talk to someone else, okay, right? And so if he's talking to me about wire nuts when I'm talking to him about plumbing, he's not my guy. Look, there's a whole lot of Christians out there who are talking about wire nuts and two-by-fours when people are asking about the plumbing of Jesus Christ. Do we understand that? See, we have to, if Bob is knowledgeable about plumbing and he's friendly and he's kind to me, he's nice, he shows me, he guides me along the path, right? If he does, then I say Menards is a good place to go. How about those Christians who are out there? They're the only reflection of Jesus Christ that people are going to see. They're the only church that some people will ever, do you understand some people will never attend a church building? They will never come to a church service. So we're the only church some people will ever attend. So here's the thing. Are we knowledgeable about God? Are we friendly? Are we loving? Are we accepting? Are we willing to guide? See, because if we're not knowledgeable about God, but we're claiming to be a Christian, we're claiming to be a Christ follower, that's what they're going to see, and they're going to be like, fake. If we're not nice, if we don't love on them, we aren't willing to take them by the hand and guide them, hypocrite. I want nothing to do with it. You and I may be the only reflection they have, the only example given to them of Jesus Christ or the church, what we call the church today. So we need to be knowledgeable of it. We need to understand that. The thing is that some of us think that we have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. We have the answer, right? We have the answer, so the only one that really matters, but do we have it? Because are we getting this into this? Is this coming into here? Are we really there? Are we really having that conversations? Are we really listening? Are we really interacting? Do we know God? The problem is most don't. But I went to church on Sunday. Pastor said, that's all I need to know. That's why I don't share everything out of Exodus. That, and we don't want to do a year-long series, I don't think. Right? But I want you to go and continue to study and grow. Right? And so um, the thing is that we have to understand we don't know everything. We have to know that, that, that we, have to, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with ourselves and honestly accept our limitations. We have to be honest and honestly accept our limitations. Okay, because we have them. Moses had them. We have them. I have them. You have them. All of us have them. And if we're gonna if we're gonna do what God calls us to, and we're willing to accept our limitations, right? If we're willing to s- accept our limitations, we have to admit that we have a limited capacity. Also, say that I have a limited capacity. Because we do. There's only so much I can do. There's only so much you can do. Only so much you can do. Right? But it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it to the best of our abilities. It doesn't mean we can't be a leader. Right? Moses had limited capacities. Some of us out here are saying, no, 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 Pastor, here's the thing. Guess what? No, uh, Sheldon, mm -mm, mm -mm. I don't have limited capacities. I have to do it all. I have to do it self. I have all capacity. If, it, if I can't do it, no one can do it. Some of us have that mindset. Trust me, <laughs> I know a guy <laughs> who has had that mindset, right? I lived it for a long time. We have to understand, I have a, I have a limited capacity. If I had learned that a lot earlier in life, well, I wouldn't be here because I'd probably have been down a different path, right? Um, the reality is I had to learn that, and I learned it the hard way. I want to help save some of you all this, the, some of those steps, some of those headaches, 
we have a limited capacity, and soon as we're, sooner we're willing to a- admit to that, the better off we'll be. See, because I had the mindset that I'll just work harder, and I'll just put in more hours, and I'll just, and I'll just, and I'll just. The problem is there's only so much work harder that you can, that you can attain. There's only, I can still only do so much as me. You can only still do so much as you, okay? You have a limited capacity to work harder. However, there's no limit to your ability to work smarter. There's zero limit to your ability to work smarter other than you. Right? God doesn't want us to work harder. Does that mean he doesn't want us to work hard? No. Does it mean we're not supposed to put out 100%? No. But what it means is he wants us to work smarter. He wants us to work. See, he wants me to pour into you. He wants me to pour into you. He wants me to pour into you and you and everyone here. And you know what? He wants me to pour into everyone out there too. That doesn't mean I go and I'm like Sheldon's got to teach everyone, right? It means that Sheldon does what God calls him to do, and he shares it with those around him, and he teaches and trains up others to come up because Sheldon is limited in his ability to work harder. Okay? So do we understand that we have a limited capacity? Okay? Verse 17, Moses' father-in-law replied, What are you doing? Uh, Excuse me. What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Look, folks, you can't handle it alone. What God's called us to, you can't handle alone. God never created a single one of us to work alone. Not a one of us has ever been created to work alone. Adam was created by himself, and God said, "Mm -mm, no good, took a rib, apparently the rib that knows all things, and gave it to the women, right? And so created woman because it wasn't good for man to be alone. We cannot, we have never, that's the only time any of us was created by ourselves. There was no one else around for him. Doesn't mean God hadn't already thought about Eve. But what I'm saying is, he's the, because he, he was the first one. He's the only one who didn't have anyone around. There's people all around us. There's people absolutely all around us. And God intends us to work with others, to walk with others. We can't handle it alone. Verse 19, listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. It's nice that he's praying for him. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. See what just happened there? Jethro just gave Moses leadership step number one. Okay? Teach them. Show them. Help them. Let them help you. Ask them to help you. Encourage them. Train them that they can help you. Right? Leadership number one. Now Moses, he's never been a leader. The beauty of Moses is, even though he was reluctant sometimes, you know, the reality was he was willing to do whatever God asked him to do. Ultimately, that was the thing. Are we willing to do the same? Now, if we know the story of Moses, we we know there was a challenge or two in there. But there's been a challenge or two in your life too, hasn't there? Guess what? There's going to be more. Right? But ultimately, Moses continues to follow what God's called him to do. And God's put Jethro in Moses' life to help guide Moses. Verse 21. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. You notice that not all of them are treated the same, right? And some of you are thinking, well, that's not fair. But here's the reality. If you're wired to lead 10 and I throw a 1,000 at you, nobody wins. 
if you're wired to lead a thousand and I throw a ten at you, nobody wins. You never li- are able to live the fulfillment of what God has planned for you. So each according to their abilities is what it's saying here. Okay? And so it's not God being mean. It's actually God being smart. <laughs> right? That's what it is. It's God being smart about it because he knows he created each of us individually. He knows he didn't create all of us to lead a thousand. He didn't create all of us to create all of us to lead ten. He created us all individually. We are all unique in our own way. And we all need to lead according to how God wired us. So Moses, um, Jethro, I mean, helps Moses to prayerfully. Did you notice that he says, he says, and may God be with you. See, God's not with you if you're not communicating with him. He wants, to be, he wants him to be prayerful with God so he knows who to give the 1,000, who to give the 100, who to give the 10, who to give the 52, right? He's teaching him to be prayerful as a leader, and that's what each of us needs to be also, is prayerful as a leader so that we be wise according to God's plan. Verse 22. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. They will, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Satisfied according, uh, the unwritten part is satisfied according to God's plan. Right? That we can go home satisfied because some of us, guess what? We're never satisfied. Can I, is, is that a true statement? Right? Anyone disagree with me on that one? Um, I dare you to raise your hand. Okay, so, uh, um, but I mean, the reality is we're, we aren't, right? So uh, according to God's plan, satisfied um, according to God's plan. And so, so but did you notice that, that it, he also said, if you do this and God so commands, don't go out and do what Sheldon wants to do. Sheldon needs to go out and do what God's leading him to do, what the Holy Spirit's put on me to do. Not just what Sheldon wants to just willy-nilly do my thing, right? Um, and as it's for you too, right? So what God desires for you to do, what God commands or leads you to do. So uh, I want to share two things with you real quick, um, two ways that people fail at com- being committed to God's plan. Okay, the first one is that there are those who are committed to God's plan who insist on doing it their way. I want to do it my way. And there are people who fail when they're committed to, because they're committed to doing God's plan and they want to do it alone. When we decide we're going to do God's work, but we're going to do it our way instead of his way, or we're going to do it alone instead of with the people he surrounds us with, that plan will fail. And it'll fail every time. Maybe not at first, but it will fail. And it will not be what God planned it to be. So we must be committed to doing it along with other people. We need to do it along with people. See, his plan, his way, right? That's what we need to do. His plan, his way, and and do it with others, alongside others, okay? Um, So, uh, because we're never meant to be, what? Alone, right? So, um, so... Um, and I want you to understand, this doesn't matter, right? Um, maybe, maybe you're saying the only place I'm a leader is at home. That's the most important place for you to be a leader. It starts there, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it, it, that's where it starts. Start with a family. If you're not leading your family, <laughs> you're not leading. whether you're leading your family, whether you're leading your business, whether you're leading, uh, maybe you're leading doing something here, leading a life group, uh, uh, maybe uh, leading CR, uh, leading whatever here, right? Uh, leading, leading the team when it comes to like doing the meal for, for, for VBS and that sort of thing, right? Wherever you're leading, whether you're leading here, you're leading somewhere else, doesn't make any difference. We, we just need to remember that it's always, we should always be prayerful about it. We should always be listening to what God says, prayerful with God, Right in prayer with God, not at God, right, and and doing it His way, not our way, and bringing others along with us. 
So, so we need to, we must be prayerfully uh, learn our role. Uh, we must have, uh, uh, um, because we all have a significant calling, uh, we must be honest, uh, honestly accept our limitations because we're all limited capacity, right? And, and the third thing is we must carefully access our team. We must carefully access our team. And you might be thinking, but I don't have a team. I guarantee you do. You're not Adam. There are people around you. You have a team. There's people around you. Whether you accept them on your team or not, whether you're willing to be on the team with them or not, you know, you're playing, you're playing uh, 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 basketball, and, and, man, if Shaq's on the court to choose from, yeah. But if little Timmy is, well, he is, he's not on my team. I'd rather play by myself. Right? Now, you've got a team around you. God put Timmy there too, okay? So he's got a purpose, and he's part of the plan. But are you willing to play, and are you willing to, to access the team that God's placed around you? Okay? So um, the thing is this. Many of us try to live this journey on our own. Many of us reject the teammates that God's got for us, the family mates that God's got for us. Many of us prefer to take the journey by ourselves. And when we take that journey by ourselves, we crash and burn. And, and remember this, I shared this with you a couple weeks ago, right? Okay, so, so um, he, who is, he who leads and has no followers is what? Just out for a walk. Just out for a walk because you got nobody. You're not leading anybody. We have to have those who are following. We have to have those who are around us. Now, does that mean that we should no longer be following anybody? Absolutely not. Moses is following. He's following Jethro's instruction, right? Why? Because Jethro's a man of God. And so he could take his advice, he could follow his advice, and know that he's getting wise, godly advice. Right? And so he's, he's not alone, and he's not simply out taking a walk. Because he's got a whole Hebrew nation with him. Guess what? You and I have a Hebrew nation that's supposed to be following along with us too. Maybe it's not one and a half million people, give or take. Right, but 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 it, if it's us, we probably have it's more on the take side, probably right. <laughs> so right, but but the honesty, honestly, I mean, we we have our Hebrew nation with us. There's there's people who are following you, over and over again. I've shared with you what your kids are watching. Your kids are watching. Your coworkers are watching. The people in the grocery store are watching. The people at the gas station are watching. People are learning. There are people around you. And you should have them on your team. Not necessarily all of them. But you should certainly have some of them on your team. We have a significant calling. We have a limited capacity. But we're never limited when we're being smart and we're doing what God leads us to do and we're allowing others in with us on this journey. And if we're going to lead with effectiveness, we must move from me to we. Okay? We have to move from me to we. Folks, if you don't get this, you're going to, man, you're going to be, oh, what a, what a, what a ugly journey it's going to be. When it's only me, it's only I, it's my thing, and it's not we, our thing, us. We have to get from me to we. And when we do that, when we understand that, when we get, we go from me to we, when we do that, then we have untapped abilities. We have untapped abilities, okay? That opens up the whole world of things. That opens up everything that God's got a plan for. See, Moses is sitting there, um, wearing himself out, getting frustrated and all that stuff, right? Um, trying to meet people's needs, but he can't meet their needs. Why? Because he's one in the, middle, in the middle of one and a half, give or take, million people. He can't, he cannot, all he's doing is wearing himself out. He's just, he's wrecking himself. Um, he had people, though, that could help him. And Jethro has pointed that out. See, because there's people in the wings. It says there was the people who were around him, right? And there's people there that are going, man, if you'd have just, I could have, I could have answered that question. I had that answer. I, he taught me. I had the answer. 
I know what the, oh, I know where that's at in the law. I could share that with him. That dispute, I could have settled that. But he won't let me. If he would just let me, I could do that. And we have people in our life, if we just let them, could do that. There's people in this church. There are some standing around. And I haven't seen what it is you could be doing. Don't be afraid to tell me because I want to use you. I want to share this journey with you. There are folks in this, in this congregation who have stepped up and said, hey, I could, I could, and I'm like, sweet. Because you know what? I'm smart enough. I figured it out <laughs> eventually. <laughs> okay, it took me a while. <laughs> um, but I figured it out. I can't do it by myself. There is no way. If Stephanie had not been tapped a long time ago at the beginning of this, this church body, um, if she had not been tapped to, to children's ministry, that ministry would not be where it's at, okay? And some are sitting here going, well, it's pretty small. Yeah, guess what? There's some more in here who aren't tapped. There's some in here that have been tapped and have resisted or rejected. There's some that here tell me uh, it'll be we do something, right? And, oh, you should have said something because I, I know this and I can do that and I can help. And I'm like, where were you? <laughs> I'm not too shy about what we're doing around here, right? Moses wasn't shy about what he was doing, right? And so he, he, he taught those around him, ultimately teaches those around him that they can, teach, they, they can take care of the thousands, the hundreds, the fifties, and tens. That's exactly what I do whenever I have the opportunity. When I can, and when I see it, I see that little sparkle in your eye, I'm going to be like, hey, dude, check it out. You want to? Right? How'd you help greet? Tapped you. Yep. Come on now. You can do it. Um, you, you just stepped up and said, Psh, we'll sing. I'm like, yeah, check it out. Right? Um, had no idea. I didn't, I didn't know you wanted to sing, right, until we had conversations and whatever, Brett. Right? Um, Weekend Warriors, you're out there, you're painting houses, you're doing things like that, doing little projects here and there, right? Man, living, yeah, I got an opportunity. There's a project, guess what? Darcy, you find out, don't you, right? I don't hide it. I talk about all this stuff we're doing, right? And I try to tap whoever I know, right? And then, and then, I, then, they, then they come up to me and say, well, I didn't know. I don't know how you didn't. Um, but that's okay. Let's talk about it then. Because I'm still not going to reject them then, am I? The reality is I still want them to walk along with us. So if I haven't tapped you in something, or maybe we had a conversation a year and a half ago and somebody forgot what you said, right? If I missed it, because I do that, right? Then come and talk to me. Saying, man, you got all these people around you, use them. All you're going to do is burn yourself out. And whenever I start getting frustrated and I start feeling burnt out, when I look back at it and then I look and I go, I wasn't tapping people. I wasn't inviting them along. Right? And if you look back at what you're doing, where you're trying to lead, the path you're on, if you're on God's path, he's got people around you to help you walk that path that you can lead. And as, as I lead some here, they start leading others. And they lead others, and they lead others. That's exactly what this is all about. That's what God wants us to do. So let's look at, I want to I look at verse uh, 15 and 16 again, okay? Because um, some, some people are like, well, why would anyone want to wear themselves out, Right? And here's what I, here's, here's, I, I think there's two ways we can read verses 15 and 16. The first being, when Moses is talking, he says, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I have to decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. And I think that's kind of where Moses was at with it. It was like, this is, it was put on me, it's my responsibility. I, I, I want to fulfill my responsibility as best as I can, right? 
um, uh, but I want to submit to what God's asking me to do. So I just want to, you know, and, and, and then there's another way. And it can be, uh, and it would be more like this. It'd be because the people come to me and seek God's will, right? They come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me. And I decide, I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. See the difference? A whole lot of, what one is, I'm trying to submit. I'm trying to do it right. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm trying to do it right. And the other one's all, call, all full of arrogance. The sad part is the church today, Christians today, so-called Christians today, are the second. They're the second. There's all this arrogance going on. I'm a Christian. I know the Bible. I got this. Blah, 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 blah. I'm this. And I'm that. And I'm that. Blah, blah, blah. All that I, me stuff, and there's no we, us. It's a, I got it. I got it because I'm special. You're not special. I'm special. Guess what? My scripture says that we're all uniquely made. We're all specially made. We're all de- made for a purpose, created for a purpose. And each of us, it's in an individual purpose. Guess what? No, I am not made any better than you, nor you, nor you. And you're not made any better than me. The reality is, how well do we listen to God's calling upon our life? The reality is, how well do we lead? There's a whole lot of preachers out there. I had a conversation. I've had a couple conversations in the last three days here um, about televangelists. There's a whole lot of preachers out there, televangelists. Some who are not televangelists think they are, right? Um, uh, and I'm not saying all televangelists are bad, right? Um, but but what I'm saying is there's a whole lot of them out there all full of arrogance, all full of self, all full of what I want, what I need. What Oh, but I need another Learjet, right? There's all this, uh, this uh, and, and people are saying, you know what? Them Christians suck. Them Christians are ugly, they're wicked. Them Christians are all hypocrites. Them Christians are all about themselves and not about anyone else because they're not being led well. And when a congregation's not led well, how can it follow well? And how can that congregation become the leaders that God desires them to be? Because I could tell you straight up, there isn't a single person in this room. God doesn't desire to be leading somewhere in life. Whether it's the 10, the 50, the 100, the 1,000. If I ever come off to you as arrogant, please confront me. The last thing I want to be is arrogant. I don't have all the answers. I know the one who is the answer, though, and that's who I want to introduce to you. Think about this. Even if each of us was the least of these and each of us only led 10 others, only was a leader to 10 others, down the path that God has chosen for us, the way God's chosen us to take it, not the way we want to do it on our own, but the way God calls it to be, and we were actual, true-to-life Christ followers, which if we're Christ followers means we're leading like Christ as well, right? Imagine if each and every person in here was leading 10 people down the path that Christ desires for them, the path that Christ died for them to follow. Imagine if each of us would step up and just lead 10. The difference we'd make in this community. Imagine if even one out of each of those 10 stepped up and led another 10. Imagine the difference we could make in our community. Imagine in our, in our region, I should say. And imagine if out of those, even just one of each of those 10 led 10 more. Imagine the difference in our country. Please join me before the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you, Father God, for your message. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart. Father God, I just ask that you have your hand on each of us as we wrestle with this because there's some wrestling going on. There's wrestling in eyes in here right now. Father God, there's wrestling in hearts and in minds. Father God, I ask that they would each, you would help them each come to you and just kneel before you. 
My prayer is that they kneel before you and say, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Jethro just spoke. He helped Moses. Pastor just shared. He's trying to help me. Father God, what, what do I need to do? Father God, help us each to be prayerfully, prayerfully come to you. Help us to listen to what you lead us to, listen to what you have to say, listen to your voice, and that each of us would go and lead the 10, the 50, the 100, or the 1,000 that you desire for us to lead. That we would further your kingdom for your glory, not ours, but for your glory, Lord. Just pray these things in Jesus' loving name. Amen.